have to speak out these about a month ago. Uh, I will now call the regular meeting of the Niles <coughs> District Library Board of Trustees to order. It is 7 p.m. on Wednesday, December 18th, 2019. Diane, please take the word. Uh, Carrie Diamond, excuse my voice, gave previous notice. She's running a little late. Carolyn? Here. Diane? Here. Ready? Here. Linda? Here. Tim? Here. And Sue will see the absence she gave previous notice. Thank you. Uh, let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we have a special guest tonight joining us uh, is Scott Euler from Klein, Thorpe, and Jenkins. Mr. Euler is an election specialist. Trustee Driblick requested that we put an item on the agenda. Procedures regarding trustee term limits, petition for referendum. And since this is legal matter, I invited Ms. Bueller to attend uh, to make sure we understand our role in handling the term limits referendum question. And I am also moving Carolyn's item up on the agenda so we can let uh, Mr. Euler, uh, we can limit Ms. Euler's time at our meeting. Uh, so, Carolyn, this is your agenda item. What uh, are you looking for the board to do on this? Um, actually, I wanted an explanation of what um, the library's role is when they receive petitions for referendum. Um, I did FOIA the um, emails between Susan and the attorney, so I um, obtained quite a bit of information. But I just want to make sure I understand what Susan's role is as director when she receives petitions for referendum. Okay. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a little bit out of the ordinary. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, nice to have somebody take an interest in this area of specialization. I'm going to answer questions all the time about elections. This is a uh, somewhat unique election process where um, a group of uh, citizens here in Niles, in the Library District, have circulated a petition uh, to place a question on the ballot about potential term limits for uh, trustees running for office for this board. So most campaigns track a limited period of time just before the election. Those years look like you do. The candidates running for uh, election to boards like the Library Board, Village Board, um, Park Board, this is a process where you can circulate petitions whenever you want. And you submit those petitions once you have sufficient signatures. Um, if you have a question that you can place on the ballot, uh, the question is initiated under the Constitution. And you then submit it to the, the uh, local election official in your library district, which you've done here. Since you can do that at any point in time, it's not necessarily as close in time to an election. So it has to be certified to the county clerk the election department, uh, 68 days before the election. So once the petitions are received, the only next step in the process, assuming no one challenges the petitions, is that there should be a certification 68 days before the upcoming election. I think the election that was that was set forth in the petition was November 2020. Right. So 68 days before that November election, uh, the certification has to be shared with the county clerk's office. Uh, if it were certified before then, could be, doesn't have to be. Uh, the clerk at any point in time can still, the local election official can still address the petitions if for some reason somebody were, I'm not saying anybody's challenging the petitions, but if somebody did, the certification can always be changed by the local election official up to that 68 days. Okay, <clears throat> now I believe um, there is what we call apparent conformity, which is which represents certain um, details in the petition that need to need to follow a certain procedure. Otherwise, it won't be accepted. And I believe that's what Susan was trying to make sure she knew when to file it and if the um, pages were correct. And I forgot what else. But there were a few things. And I think you called it apparent conformity, which is what she needed to know in order to process these right. petitions. So, 
So there's a limited role for the local election official in accepting candidate petitions or referendum petitions. Uh, as sort of the gatekeeper of the election process, the local election official is supposed to ensure that on the face of the petitions, they comply with the basic requirements of the election code. So here, basic requirements would be signatures. There, there is a threshold signature requirement here that has to be met. If you got 20 signatures, we, you didn't, but if you got 20 signatures mm -hmm. from a, uh, a group of residents submitting a petition, the local election official should not certify that question because it generally wouldn't satisfy the threshold um, number of signatures that you need. Uh, you check to make sure that the, the question is stated correctly. In this case, as far as I can tell, it looks like it's been stated correctly. Um, that the signatures are from people who live in the library district <laughs> in general. If you're checking, again, just on the, the face of the petition, whether or not it satisfies the very basic uh, fundamental requirements of the election code. There are a lot of requirements, but um, some of them are, are fundamental and can be easily discerned by just examining the face of the sheets of the petition. So, okay, um, so, so that's what apparent conformity means. The local election official is supposed to ensure that on the face of the petitions they comply with the basic requirements of the code. And that was what Susan was doing. Um, what I noticed though, November 21st, there were um, some questions from Susan Lemke to you and um, they appear to me to be more questions searching for objections, which I don't believe is really her role. I think if anyone was to challenge these petitions, it wouldn't be the director of the library. So I was concerned that, um, that our director was um, using not only her time, but our attorneys to answer questions that should have been provided by someone personally or privately, not the library. And that's really why I wanted to bring this up at our board meeting, because um, her questions certainly um, certainly represent objections. Um, there were three of them, and you answered them and clarified. But um, I, I'm also wondering why Susan would have even attempted to do that, and I hope our trustees who are affected by this petition would not have given her that direction. But um, again, as a trustee, and I am, um, you know, I am duly elected by the residents, I need to make sure that we're not using your services for someone's personal gain, which is why I questioned those, uh, her email as of November 21st, which did not appear to be questions that fell under apparent conformity. Uh, I don't remember the question specifically. I asked them if it will help you. Sure. I, I will say this generally that, and this isn't election season, but when we do hit election season and when things heat up a bit um, locally between candidates or relative to referenda, that we get lots of calls in our office from local election officials in school districts, villages, cities, uh, asking questions about where the boundaries are for the local election official to process petitions to make sure that oh, they're following the procedures. Oh, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Right. So we get a lot of questions and we may advise the local election official, look, this is something you need to look into, this is something you may not need to look into, uh, but because it happens so periodically, every two, every two years, it's infrequent, um, we get a lot of calls about how to process petitions correctly. Oh, I totally understand, but once again, I don't think her role is to try to locate objections in the petitions that were submitted. She was just to follow um, the apparent conformity. Okay, Carolyn, that is not my only role as the local elections official. I did need to find out whether, for example, the misstatement of the library's names made it, was going to throw the petition out altogether. There are, if there are things in that question that are incorrect, but as I found out from Mr. Euler, they were not, they didn't rise to a level that I would not certify it. There were questions that I legitimately, as the local official, elections official, needed mm -hmm. to get the answers to. Okay, when you, when you say to throw it out, it would have been thrown out by whom, for what reason? Well, if it was an error? The other piece of the apparent conformity doctrine, I guess I didn't explain, if a local election official did determine that petitions were not in apparent conformity, then they would not certify them to the ballot. So if a candidate brought in petitions uh, and didn't collect enough signatures, the candidate can tender those 
uh, petitions to the local election official. The local election official examines the petitions. If they don't comply with the basic requirements, they don't certify them for the ballot. Okay. But would that apply to this question? One of my fellow library directors raises the question, I'm not sure a binding petition for term limits for library trustees in any district is actually legal if voted and passed. Is that something yes. that she would need to be concerned about? Sure, that's a very good yeah. question. Because almost all referenda have to be based on a statute. I think that's a very legitimate question. So then this I, is not considered an objection to a petition? It, if. It, if you were, if this referendum petition was required to be based on a statute, and it wasn't based on a statute, it would either become an advisory referendum, or it's possible that it's not authorized at all. If someone is seeking to place a binding referendum on the ballot, and it's not authorized by statute, which it has to be, there are no uh, local government bodies can't simply ask a binding question unless you're a home rule unit, uh, place it on the ballot, and it has some binding legal effect, it has to be provided for by statute. Here, this petition, this particular referendum question, is being, um, is authorized under a section of the Constitution for citizen-initiated petitions. And that's a very unique uh, referendum petition for a local government to receive in the first place. I don't think it's unusual at all for a local election official to call on this then and say, what is this and how is it authorized and how does it come to be? So if this was an error, what would Susan need to do? If it wasn't... If for some reason... Right, um, if it wasn't authorized by statute, she wouldn't process it. She would not She would not certify the question for the ballot. She wouldn't have to certify it, okay. With and the county clerk. So then, any question, so then that's not an objection to the petition, it's just Susan... Uh, it, could be, it could be either. A citizen could also object to a petition on that basis if the local election official uh, still processed the petition, still, still still tried to certify them for the ballot, an objection could also be raised by a resident of the library. But Susan, Susan wouldn't certify if that was an error, correct? It or really it depends. Didn't follow the statute. It de if it didn't follow the statute, then you wouldn't certify it. Okay. If, if our office got a call of that nature, if we examined a petition and said, look, this is not authorized by any statute for, in this case, a library district, our our feedback would be it shouldn't be certified for the ballot. Okay, so then your answer would apply to her other two questions as well. The oddities in the way the name of the district was written. Which has which is a frequent election objection that is raised and has been argued and litigated. Um, so we have better answers about those particular questions than we have had in the past. We have clear, greater clarity. Okay, and then the last one was, oh, she was questioning um, the statement about the um, effective immediately. I think there was some confusion about someone was under the impression they were going to cut into a term, right. but and, not actually. And another good question, yeah. and nobody knows that better than your town that has had uh, two term limit questions placed on the ballot, I think, at the same time. Mm -hmm. So issues arose about which one was going to, uh, which one would supersede the other, and I think the form of the questions, if I remember those. Was yeah. Well, well, there were some questions about how the term, the existing terms, would be affected, if they would be impacted, uh, whether you're cutting question. off terms. Yes. Right. So those are very important questions to be answered by this kind of a question. This question is framed in a way that that does not appear to be an right. issue. Right. But it's a serious concern when you're framing a question like this, whether or not you're going to cut anybody's term short, which you can't. Oh, absolutely. But I think it was just a misunderstanding of what was actually stated because it doesn't say that. All right, well, that, those are my concerns. Um, I looked at these three questions as objections, reasons for objections. I didn't... They could also be objections, either okay. one. So. All right, well, thank you for that clarification. My, my question is, if she passed it and later on something brought it up and they were against, you know, these questions weren't answered and something, these were legitimate questions that she didn't answer, would she have personally gotten in trouble for it? Well, that's a good question. The local election officials are considered to be, and they're called in the cases, gatekeepers of the election process. So they do have the limited role of examining election petition sheets to ensure, whether they're referendum petition sheets or candidate sheets, to ensure that they fundamentally abide by the requirements of the election law. So. I do not know what would happen if a citizen brought a suit against a local election official for failure, for gross failure to, to address um, 
petitions that were inadequate and were still certified for the ballot. I haven't seen that kind of a claim brought before, but it is a responsibility of a local election official to examine the sheets. I've seen where a local official got sued by a person who put a petition out there because they said there were things that weren't legal in it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is, she was asking you to give, you gui to give her guidance, so that's the correct thing to do. Yeah, she did. So, as I mentioned, we, get, we do get a lot of calls. It doesn't and make sense. Fairly complicated. Well, the question Sounds was like not that's the her. right thing to do. The question wasn't was it was she not allowed to ask for advice? My concern was were these objections or questions that fall under her role? So, um, yes. according to the attorney, yeah, they're they're yes. like double double sided questions. So that's fine. Thank you for explaining. You welcome. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions for Scott? Mm -hmm. Election questions. Like election questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got people encroaching on my property. And my house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, being a person who would possibly want to run again and not have a term limit, um, can we put a, an additional referendum then on to negate this one? There are up to three referendum questions allowed on the ballot at any particular election oh. for each governmental entity. Okay. So is, how is this considered a governmental for the, for the library, the library. The if we're in a district rather than the village. So the village could place separate three questions. Three, right. and it's we're like in our own entity. <coughs> yes. So there's a rule of three that applies to every governmental unit. Mm -hmm. So we're our own governmental unit, basically. So we get a three. Okay. Okay. Right. We just need to have that put in 68 days prior. Yeah. Correct. Right. Uh, or earlier than that to make 92. sure we're a three. They're, right. They're, you know, we're the one of the top three. 92 days prior? Right. The a citizen initiated petition under uh, Section 2870 of the Election Code and Article 7 of the Constitution, the Illinois Constitution, mm -hmm. has to be submitted at least 92 days to the lo local election official. Then the local election official has to certify that question, not, not more right. than 30, 68 days, not less than 68 days before the election. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. 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 Where, if you were in your second term immediately, like right then, like for Carolyn, she's in her second term, that it couldn't just stop her from being in it. Yes, you, you can't cut off under the Illinois Constitution. You can't take a vested right away from the electors by cutting a, an elected official's term short because they after are, they've been elected. Okay. Right. All right. After, okay. Got it. But I can't run again if it was passed. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Okay, thank okay. you so much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, we will continue the meeting. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting okay. of November 20th, 2019? Second. Katie and Diane. Are there any changes? Um, I did want to add, I think, two sentences. Uh, let's see, under the auditor, I think it's the first page, page three, library audit. <coughs> I wanted to add, um, the auditor recommended a complete inventory and valuation of capital assets to create detailed capital assets records in compliance with the new policy. Trustee Derblick suggested inventory compliance within the next few months instead of waiting a year. I have no objection. I do. There it is. And what would the objection be? The objection would be, it isn't anything in here that you saw that was misspelled or anything? You, Those you are the ones include, I will look at. You didn't include my statement in minutes, according to the attorney, 
are supposed to be an accurate account of what was said. This has nothing to do with the paragraph that's in there. I still don't approve it. But see, you can't personally disapprove. As I, a board, said, I, I said, I said, but as opinion. a board, this isn't a personality conflict. I'm not saying it is, but every meeting, you always have to add something. Because nobody else it. does. We have things that are said that are put in there. Not, obviously, they're not important to you. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, I did say this, and it's not in the minutes, and I'm requesting it be in the minutes. But no one's quote is in here, Carolyn. Not I'm not interested in what I'm not interested in what you want. I don't I'm, not I'm still in what saying, saying no, Carolyn. You have to put every single person's no, quote. No, you in don't. There. You don't. Okay, then we don't. Have this to put was yours a in point that was brought up. That's not in the minutes, and it's important. If you you want to play this game, go right ahead. Okay, um, I'm playing it. No, I realize it, but you know, elected officials should not be immature. Oh, you talk about oh, okay. yourself. Okay. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, I did have another comment I wanted to add to Susan's, um, let's see, where is it? I don't know, I'm sorry. Oh my, let's see, it's regarding, oh, public comments. The man who talked about... Actually, Carolyn, can I interrupt you for one second? Yeah. I need to have a rule, I need to have a discussion or, or a rule as to what our procedures are for allowing changes to the minutes. Because I, I, I don't think, I think it's just a vote on the board, isn't it? Right? It's not a matter of person who made the motion, person who seconded, agreeing to it. No, they do have to agree to we it. They do have to agree Yes. We have to agree to the motion. They do have to agree. Yes. Well, okay. Yeah, I mean, because otherwise someone could make a different motion. Okay, so the procedure is somebody makes a motion to make a change. Well, no, someone... You as as Carolyn made. To, to uh, approve the minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. Someone makes a second mm -hmm. to approve it. Right. As is. They put their name in. Correct. As is. And only if they agree to the change can you proceed with their motion. Otherwise... If they say, no, I don't approve the change, then it stands. You can either vote it up or down. So let's say, I don't know, who made the motion? I did. Yeah. So if Penny does not agree to the change, uh -huh. she says no. And then um, people can vote it up or down. Vote what up or down? So so I think, think it's as, as written. As written. As written. So she's, she's made a motion to approve it as written, I presume. Mm -hmm. Correct. And she can accept a friendly amend an amendment to right. her motion, but if she right. doesn't accept it, she says no, it stands as is, okay. and then people can either vote the motion up or down as she's made it. And if they, if they don't agree, if they do want any change that's proposed, they vote it down, and then someone else can make a motion to uh, pass the minutes with a certain amount ah. on it. Okay. So we have to vote. Okay. So that, okay. This is very confusing. <laughs> Sorry, but it's very confusing. So Patty made a motion to accept the minutes as written. Mm -hmm. Carolyn made a motion to amend she the minutes. She did not make a motion. Make a motion. motion. There's, There's only one motion. Carolyn had a suggestion that we amend the minutes. Mm -hmm. So now we have to vote as whether or not to accept the minutes as written. Mm -hmm. Or not. Yeah. Now sometimes the movement and second will accept a friendly suggestion. Gotcha. Okay. They'll say, Oh yes, you're right, it should be that. All right. But if they don't accept that suggestion All right. and say, No, I want my motion to stand as is, ah. we go down as So is. they're not accepting the changes or not. They're accepting the change to the motion. Because uh, they made a motion to yeah. accept the minutes right. as we mm -hmm. Okay. Minutes as amended. Just like last time we had somebody said they saw errors in that. Okay. And sometimes the movement will say, yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So it's up to Patty and Diane. And now, what if, and then Diane, if Patty says yes, but Diane says no? It doesn't, uh, is that true? It doesn't fly unless there's okay, a, so a, that's a, a new movement. In this particular case. No. All right. 
but you still need to get anybody else's potential corrections. Correct. Before you vote. All right. Okay. All right. Can I get another suggestion? Can I? Absolutely. Now? Yes. Not okay. Um, under public comments, I wanted to, um, wanted to add. Um, four. Um, resident recommended $5 charge for yoga. Susan Lemke received a $4,000 grant for, I called it senior problem, senior programs to cover this cost. I thought maybe we wanted to add that in there. Uh, I agree myself, uh, but I would, I would say that the library accepted received a four thousand dollar grant rather than Susan. Oh yeah, because it was the library. Right. Sure. But I, but I wasn't just for yes, I mean it's no. four thousand no, dollars. Senior, 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 right, senior, senior program. right, senior program. I don't think my comments should be part of the public somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But that's it's about, it's 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 about, it's about yes, I agree too. Uh, the public uh, comments should be what the what the resident said. You know, that he mentioned. Well, that is true, Carol. Okay, then we don't. I just wanted. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, that's fine then. Right. It makes sense. Uh, Thank you. And, and Chris, <coughs> it's in the director's report. Oh, it, it, it is, is in the director's report. Okay. Because I remember reading. Yeah, it's over there on the bullet, middle bullet point, Carolyn. Carolyn? Pardon me. It's on page five. Yes, I did see yeah, it okay. there. I just thought it would. Nah, I, I, but it's I guess that was that person's comment. All right. Thank you, though. All right. Okay. Can we have a vote? This is uh, approved. The minutes as written. Okay, Karen. Yes. Karen. No. Yes. Yes. Linda. Yes. Uh, yes. All right. Very good. Um, has anyone registered for public comments? No. Sorry. Good. very much all right I remind our visitors visitors that this is an opportunity for public comment this is not a question and answer session or an open debate if anyone has any specific questions please contact our executive director during normal library hours and she will coordinate <coughs> providing the answers to you and also we have a five-minute uh, limit in, per person and a 30-minute overall limit on public comment and our first speaker is Steve Doherty. You want this one? Yeah, I'll you know. You're starting on that. But what you just read. Did you already asking a question? I already yeah. said not a question and answer session. And you're already asking a question. <laughs> Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you and your family. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Steve Dowdy. I stood up here 12 months ago in an attempt to learn about this library and how it works and how you folks manage our library. What I've put on your desk uh, or in front of you is basically what I wanted to talk about and share with you. Because it's been a year. Uh, I feel that this board and administration does not work, would not work, excuse me, this board and administration does good work, but sometimes lacks the knowledge in business and facility management. I believe this administration can do a better job listening to residents and reaching out to other local government bodies and libraries when considering major purchases or resolving serious problems. As the city, who has engineers, who I'm sure will be able to offer you solutions or steer you in the right direction. Annual financial audit. Uh, this is the first thing that kind of troubled me about what's going on in this library here, is for 18 years they paid the company, let's say it this way, the last payment to the company was $18,000. I, I don't know what the first one was. But in, 19, uh, in 2019, the library sought out, sought out competitive bids for this service and is now paying less than $10,000. It went up for the taxpayers of $8,000. But, so why did the library wait so long to get competitive bids? And are there other contracts that need to be sent out for bids? Since you're not allowed to ask questions, 
it's really tough to be standing here and talking to you folks and not be able to ask anything. That's why people come here. Public comments. The current policy limits public comments to five minutes at the beginning of each meeting. Then the board president, as he just says, the board will not comment on public comments or answer any questions. This policy was debated in 2019, but no changes were made at the time for, public, for the public to speak or ask questions. Uh, again, this is the first time I've heard this uh, announcement. Uh, during the debate, uh, uh, one trustee complained that giving the public more time is going to make our meeting too long. Generally, two to four people attend this board meeting. Right now, there's two. And that's generally how many we have. Uh, one thing I didn't like is comments made by a trustee at this table when I was leaving. You're only one person, and you do not represent all of Niles, all the residents of Niles. That's a quote. I wrote it down when I left the room. Special reserves. I believe really, this lacks transparency. That or maybe I don't understand, but I would like the administration to explain to the public how this program works. Why is money put into this reserve? And do you have a plan for this money? And how does this reserve impact annual budget and tax levy? Service contracts, this is just that all service contracts should have a 30-day written uh, cancellation clause. So some surprise your attorney here who doesn't recommend this because this clause gives you an out if this person does not fulfill the contract uh, requirements. And there's no legal fees, which saves the taxpayer's money. And to me, it's simply a good business practice. Chapter 1 in newsletter. Change this frequency back to a quarterly and save the taxpayer's money. And also consider getting together with the, uh, the other four uh, groups in Niles that also print. You know, all guys got to get all to get together and go to the same printer. And give him a bigger contract to save us some money. Uh, Cook County, est estimated fair market value. In September, our fair market value increased, therefore, increasing library revenue that starts, in that starts next year. Did the library administration consider this increase before recommending an increase in our tax levy? Also, I understand that, um, oh, I forgot one thing. Uh, copy machines, stop buying them. Leave Lease them as the city, Morton Grove Library, Park Ridge Library, Glenview Library, and Stoke Library. They all do it. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. All right, our next. Timmy, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to correct a couple of things here so they are sure. left on camera with people not understanding. Absolutely. Um, the, the first thing I'd like to bring up is that audit. I just want to point out that Mr. Pritz and I recommended I that, the, I'm sorry. that the library switch auditors finished, because we have had the same auditors for too many years and Trustee Derblick and Trustee Martin are the ones who wanted to table that for the, to the following year and, it, and then so then they did vote on it the following year. We actually are the ones who put it forward in the first place. So I just want to be very clear about that. We were the ones who were concerned about making fresh eyes on everything. And the second thing I just want to be sure we understand is that the administration did not recommend an increase in our tax levy. We didn't. We don't make a recommendation. We simply give them the numbers. Those are my, the two things I just wanted to be clear about right. since it's being reported. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for answering that question. Thank you, Mr. Dark. Our next uh, person for public comments is uh, Tisha Doherty. Continuing on, Village distributes $3.4 million from ex uh, expired a TIF. A TIF ends December 31st, 2019 and will be divided into all taxing districts. Was the library administration aware of this distribution when they recommended increasing our tax levy. Page two. Recommendation and comments to, excuse me, comments to the Niles Library Board. One, roof replacement. This board approved the money to replacing the east and west roofs, one deemed in fair condition, the other in good, which cost over a million dollars. Taxpayers expect next year's budget to decrease and even a lower tax levy. 
Two, public comment policy. Review this policy to allow five minutes for the public to speak and ask administration questions and allow three minutes for the public to comment on agenda items before the, vote, the board votes. If administration is unable to answer a question, administrator, administrators must follow up by email, phone, or meeting. Then report the outcome to the board at the next scheduled meeting. Finally, allow public comment at the end of each meeting, three minutes. Three, special reserve fund. Set a limit on how much money can be put in the fund and report the current balance at each meeting, especially at the annual budget meetings. Four, library teen center. Drop this program at the library. The teen center at Gulf Mill is better equipped and better supervised and has more to offer teens in the library. Also, it will be much quieter at the library. Five, programs. Consider dropping these, senior coffee. The Senior Center across the street offers coffee and many more great programs for seniors. B, yoga. Niles Senior Center, Niles Fitness Club, Niles Park District have these programs. If I had more time, I'm sure I would find more duplications that reduce, would reduce library programs and may even reduce the number of employees and even decrease the budget. Six, library computers. Hire a consultant to audit and analyze the library's computer equipment and needs. I believe this library needs better tools and guidance for today and the future. Thank you. Great. Okay, uh, to clarify, a board member or um, member of the staff may elect to um, respond if they wish to an ID. Um, uh, and uh, just as a matter of clarification then, the library did not approve money for the roof. We approved a budget item money, uh, money for a budget item. We did not approve any money for the roof. Also, uh, Niles Teen Center, Niles Senior Center, those are the village of Niles. And we are a uh, library district that incorporates a larger portion, uh, larger area than Niles does. Okay, uh, next we have trustee reports. We we'll begin with the president's report. And if anybody else wants to make a report, they can. Uh, don't have much this uh, month. I did attend, as I believe all of us did, so congratulate all of us on attending the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, party, which uh, I found very beneficial. I spoke to a number of uh, our business owners uh, and, and um, just a couple of lawyers, a couple of different people about uh, the programs that they enjoy providing. For us. Anybody else have anything to say about uh, their trustee? Uh, yeah, I, I attended there too. I think it's interesting. A whole strip on its own by a couple of uh, people from the house. Uh, I went to the salon. Her brother actually owns the other property. So it was a new location. It was interesting. Um, I also just on this note, I want to say my husband received a letter in the mail from the Niles Main Library District saying, we found your library from the district along with his card and the envelope. So we say thank you for that public service for forgetful patrons. <laughs> I don't know who does that, but it's just nice to go. Anybody else have any, uh, Katie? Um, right before Thanksgiving, they had things for kids that were out of school. So on Tuesday, my grandson was here for the 3D printing of a snowflake a cookie cutter. Uh, Turned out really nice. He was really happy with it. And then um, following day, I took both of them. They had uh, Pet what is it? Pet Story Two or something? Pet Story. Was it that? No. Pet something. Whatever. Anyway, it was it was cute. It was nice. And then I personally have gone to Nitwits, which is the knitting and crocheting club. And it was very interesting because. Uh, our, um, it's going to come to me, her name begins with a B, Bernadetta. Bernadetta, Bernadetta. Yeah. Bernadetta was uh, actually teaching brand new people who have no experience. It came and she's teaching them how to cast on and stuff, which I thought was cool. Mm -hmm. I let her handle that because then I was with somebody else who was trying to understand how to knit European style, which is usually what I do. So I was working with her. And then we went, uh, we had the snow cake, snow pine cone, snowy pine cone uh, candle, which that was 
very fun, and there were we uh, there was uh, some of the people didn't come. So the one woman was sitting there, and her significant other came in, and Bernadette said, "Hey, come on, you can make one." And so his was better than anybody else's, which was real cool. Uh, I did fused glass, which I won't get back until the weekend. We may have to limit your access to I understand. <laughs> And so far, that was all uh, uh, according to here. And I truly uh, enjoyed everything. Nice. Any other trustees? No? Thank you very much. Good job, Gabby. Thank you. <laughs> I did pretty show and tell. Oh, yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> all right, the next item, I, I, Gabby again, is our charges report. Okay. Um, okay. I got to make sure I got the one for the right date. <laughs> This is December 18th, correct? Yep. Okay, then I've got the right one. November is the fifth month of the fiscal year, and 42% of the way through the budget. The library overall expenditures are under budget by 32%. Yeah, they are all under budget at 32%. At 32%. Yeah, I said, perfect. okay, I add in an extra word, yeah, at 32% no, 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 yeah. of the total budget. Thank you for correcting you me, are. sir. The revenue total, um, Total revenue, 48% of budget. Uh, property taxes, 47% of budget. Fines, 46% of budget. Replacement tax, 50% of budget. Investment income, 70% of budget. Passport income, 44% of budget. Salaries, excuse me, slightly lower than the budget. Page nine. Library materials at 48% budget. Library operating expenditures at 36%. The overall category is just a little under budget. Page 11, general administration at 30%. The overall category is just a little under budget. Page 12, employee spend benefit under budget at 38%. Utilities, a little under budget at 41%. Capital expenditures, under budget at 2%. Page 13, building, equipment, maintenance, under budget at 33%. Great. Very good, Patty. Any comments on the Treasurer's report? Um, yes, sir. No, I just, I, I, I just question for Greg regarding the email that we got uh, regarding Okay. Can you tell us just why you have to do that and what that information is? Uh, what's the mission? Um, this is an email that uh, got regarding the DDR. Oh, I'm not really sure what that stands for. Oh, okay. So um, uh, every year uh, we make a submission to, um, uh, it's actually to the state of Illinois, and uh, uh, the Cook County Treasurer's Office, I guess, picks it up from them. Uh, regarding the amount of uh, debt and total liabilities that's, uh, that's on our balance sheet. And the reason that we do that is because the county puts that information onto your uh, tax bills. So when you, get your, when you get your tax bill for the second installment, all of the debt, uh, including the pension debt, is all listed on the, uh, on the, uh, on the tax bill. And that's done by organization, so you know, you know, you can discern us from Cook County, from the village, from the park district. I was just wondering why they send it to us. Did they just send it to all board members of the? Uh, uh, that I, you know, if, I, 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 oh, okay. I didn't, uh, I didn't know. Okay. I didn't know that they were sending that. Okay. Yeah, I, I got that too. Okay. I okay. in fact I got it twice. It's probably to keep I you. I got it twice also. Sure. So. It's probably to keep you in line. <laughs> I think it is. So that's to the state, basically to the treasurer, and then the treasurer account will send it up to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let you know. Okay. Let you know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No. Very good. All right. I will now entertain a motion to approve the payment of bills for operating expenses expenses of two hundred thirty thousand two seventy seven and seventy nine cents. So. Uh, Payroll expenses of $291,093.36. 
Special reserve expenses of $29,224.97 for total monthly expense of $550,596.12. Do I hear a motion, Karen? Motion, yes. Second. All right. So we make the motion. All right. Any discussion on our payment of bills? Any discussion? Carol? No. Ed? No. Diane? No. Linda? Carol Lynch? Um, yes, I had a couple. Um, I noticed we have a check for CBW. Okay. Um, Page 14 area, maybe? Um, 19 in the explanation. Um, it says special reserve equipment. I was wondering what that was for. Uh, UPS is the board approved. Oh, okay. You do the 20% uh, and 80% uh, federal government. Great. Right. The un uninterrupted uh, power supplies for the uh, for the server project. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. And then I had another question about um, technology management REV fund. What is that? What page? Um, page. It's sixteen in the in the okay. register. I don't know where it is in the other one. Alphabetically, I think. Under technology management. Yeah, so we pay this mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. every month, and it's for our uh, internet connection to um, CCS. Oh. Or is it CCS? Uh, is it's it? the Illinois Century Network, um, the state of Illinois internet. Oh, it's ICN. ICN, and they changed it. Um, I don't know if there was a state statute or something that changed the name to that new name. So it used to be ICN, now it's uh, Technology Management. It's so part of the um, <coughs> State of Illinois uh, Technology Division. So Which what is access I is IDOT, actually. So. But what access, what internet access is it? Like I understand. For the library. So the library has two internet uh, egress points. One is for the staff, one is for the patrons. Um, and we have, uh, we pay either the ISP for the transport cost, or we pay the ISP cost plus uh, a different transport agent. In this case, we pay AT&T directly um, for the transport cost and ICN for the internet uh, access. All right, I gotcha. Okay. Um, I thought I had one more. Okay, I have a question about Library Furniture International. It's for some shelving, I believe. And what page you on there, Carolyn? Oh, sorry. It's okay. under 15, under L. All right, thank you. Um, I understand it's some shelving, but it's and it's coming out of, looks like a line item. I'm trying to find it here. It's like furniture and fixtures. So my question is, we have a budget line item for furniture and fixtures, and then we have we have items in our um, special <coughs> reserves for furniture items as well. Is that how we do that? I'm sorry. Repeat the question. I don't, I don't this this particular right. check is um, for shelving, and it's, mm -hmm. I believe it's from a budget line item called furniture and fixtures. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to the cipher is, I thought our special reserve fund is where monies are deposited for furniture purchases. Like when there was, remember the administration had a list of items they were going to purchase. Like some of it I think is furniture. So would that be coming out of special reserves or would it be coming out of this budget line item? Uh, this particular budget item, we try to reserve, um, we try to reserve the special reserve for you know, larger, more significant um, furniture pit, uh, purchases. So, for example, when we did the 2013 renovation and we replaced nearly all the furniture in the library, 
Um, there's you know multiple hundreds of thousands, I believe. Um, we charge that to the special reserve. But smaller, less significant uh, purchases will take out of uh, furniture. Okay, so this wouldn't have been one of the items listed under administration first. So, I don't think, no, I don't it think would, so. Because that would be coming out of special reserve. That's yeah. why it was there. Okay, well, thank you. That was my last question. Do you have a general rule of thumb of what level you would charge the special reserves? 20 grand, 50 grand, or what? Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I think generally if the, if the board's approving it, you know, should probably come out of special reserve. You know, so that it lowers the threshold from 20 years, you should better hit to like five or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, very good. Uh, Diane, could you take the roll, please? Uh, Karen. Um, yes. Carolyn. Yes. Nina. Yes. Diane. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Next item on the agenda is director's report. Uh, Susan. Yeah, I don't really have anything to highlight this month except for so trying to keep this meeting a little on the shorter sure. side for December. Um, I did just want to be sure everybody saw the part about the Nile Citizen Survey. I don't know if you might have looked at it yourself. Yeah, that was. But um, I, I was very excited to see it. ranked right behind the fire department yeah. and the EMTs. Right. Above the police, above the garbage. <laughs> yes. And I like our garbage. Well, it's always nice to be above the garbage. <laughs> yes, it is. But yeah, I think it's 94 percent that was a really, really excellent number. And it emphasizes on aspects of government. So you guys, hats on to you. Um, other than that, I think I put everything else in the report. We have a lot more of a substantial uh, agenda for the January meeting. So I'll be able to do a lot more to you for that month. Um, on the statistics, I just wanted to point out to you that on the second page of statistics, page 44, if you look at the program's year-to-date figure, it's got the two lines. The green line is attendance at programs, and the blue line is number of programs. I just wanted to highlight the fact that our attendance at programs is going up while our number of programs is going down. Mm -hmm. So I was happy about that as well. And that's even without doing Maker Fest this, this year. So. Well, can you have any uh, theories as to why that is? Um, you know, I think it's partly just that I, when Mr. O'Shea was here, he did a lot of small author programs mm -hmm. that maybe didn't get quite as big numbers. But I think they also were just, uh, you know, you get better and better at targeting what people want. And I think the staff is just doing a really excellent job. I, we did a last year appoint Cecilia Signer as program coordinator for adult services. I think she's doing a fantastic job of coming up with things that are really interesting to people, like the Downton Abbey set of programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just attracting bigger audiences, so we're we'll letting that. Cool. Uh, I have um, a question for you. Yes, sir. On page 31, could you talk a little about what Age Options is? Um, age Options is an agency that the federal government funnels uh, federal funding for, for, they don't like to be called seniors anymore, they're called older older people. Like, is that right? That doesn't sound right either, though. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> Yes, there's a bunch of names. I'm sorry, I'm skipping it. I'm blanking on it. But yeah, so they um, they offer grant opportunities. They met with us back at the end of the summer and really were kind of recruiting us to apply for this grant because they think their libraries are a great resource for the community. They want to drive more traffic to the libraries and they think that libraries, again, like the passports, we have the longer hours, we have comfortable uh, settings and a very experienced and capable staff to be managing these programs. So we've gotten $4,000 to, to spend on, could be programs, could be equipment, could actually be hiring people, um, uh, whatever we think would sure. benefit the older people that live in Niles. That's cool. Or live yes. in the district, I should say. Yes. Yeah, so we'll be doing some things off-site, some things on-site. Um, and they already they hit the ground running, but they have more ideas than they can use probably. Great. Yeah. And, so and it will help boost up some of the things that we're currently offering as well. Okay. Um, anybody? Carolyn, you have any uh, um, No, I don't. Thank you. Uh, no. No. Diane? No. Thank you. Daddy? No, thank you. Here. No, just thanks for all the pictures and information. Yes. It seems like the report is more detailed all the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm just always amazed at all the things that the library is doing that I don't even know about. So I need this report. 
I enjoyed enjoyed reading and how much stuff you have to do. Sure. Um, I did have one question. Trustee Kellogg says there was a deadline for peeling conference. Right. Uh, this is the Public Libraries Association right. conference. I know that uh, some of us, or some people have come to this in the past, too. I think you've recommended this is probably the one that's most applicable to us, uh, that is most aligned with the interests that we have. Yeah. It, the nice thing about it is it's all together. It's like uh, ALA will have many things of interest to you, and it is here this summer, but PLA, there's no question virtually everything that you could go to would have some application to a public library like ours. So you can kind of explore all sorts of things that way. It's very, it's a tighter thing, tighter set of exhibit floor. Everything there is aimed at public library rather than ALA, which is special libraries like medical libraries, legal libraries. Um, academic libraries so but it, it's an excellent conference I highly recommend it but if it's hard for people to get away for that amount of time so this it's during the weekdays uh, mm -hmm. ALA is more over the weekend PLA is more in the week mm -hmm. okay. it's, a, it's a, a great resource and the staff always come back with excellent information from it but you know if, if you do have money budgeted for conferences and if anybody wants to go they'll highly highly recommend getting it on the early break deadline Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay. Did you want to talk about patron suggestions? I think you had an item on page 45. Yeah. Um, we did have the patron comment. Somebody observed a young woman who was not able to get a library card um, because she didn't have the ID that was needed. And uh, this patron both called me up and wrote uh, this email. This. Uh, patron comment saying uh, she is concerned that we're turning people away who need to be using the library but don't have a plan and address to use for ID. And she is suggesting using the library's address um, to give them a card. And I, I answered with that. would definitely be a board decision. Um, I think it is something to think about how I, I did, you know, of course, of course they can use any of the resources of the library except the study room pretty much without a library card. But if they wanted to take anything away or use the online resources out of the building, they would, they would not be able to do that. So that's a, that's a philosophical question. So this person had no legal address, or was it just because they didn't get proof of it? I don't know. I was not there at the time. So I really am not sure what the exact circumstances were. Um, but this was a very heartfelt recommendation. So I wanted maybe to call it to your attention, and maybe you could give it some thought over the next month, and we can talk about sure. it well, next month. I will or? voice my opinion just for sure. Sure. If we had this policy, that would mean anybody in the entire world could get a library card by walking in and saying they didn't have an address. They didn't have a call. Well, I think they'd still have to prove their identity in some way. We'd still have to have some form of identification. I, what some libraries are doing is they're making an agreement with like a homeless shelter or like for us with the Y perhaps um, to, to try to facilitate people being identified in some way or other or to give, give limited use cards. Um, again, I did not hear this from the patron. I heard it from somebody else who was observing it. Is there any way, I'm sorry, if I'm going to work on is there any way to get feedback from the nearby libraries on their ways of handling the situation? Because then it gives us something to jump off of. That's a great idea. I'm just wondering if we have any homeless shelters we have there. We have the one. That's not really homeless. Well, that's where people, it's not where we run, go there and say, What is our policy that we do for students that are not in our district? It's such a high school. They, they can't get a library card. That you can. Um, we are working with the schools to get all the students that are in the district library cards. But students that are not in the district can't have our library card. They have to get their library card from their home library. But then we do allow them to use some of the more restricted things. Because if we've like been at your high school saying, come use the creative studio, but not you guys over there, we feel like that would be unfair. And same with, you know, when we were going to Emerson and offering programs. So we do uh, stretch that for them. They, they can use their other library so cards. To me, it all kind of sounds the same. So I think what we do for one group, it has to be very consistent, because otherwise we're really 
opening the doors for. We, we just, I guess we just have to think of everyone mm -hmm. and how this umbrella really works. Because just like you were saying, once you open, then you have to really be set the limited mm -hmm. cards for every. Yeah, if we had a to make it card, equitable. Yeah. yeah. So whatever the policy is, it has to be equitable for everyone, not just equal, but equitable. Yeah. yeah. So. But yeah. like for we didn't really have to think this through to make sure. Yeah. Yes. It works. It's a serious question. And like for students, I thought, like if they live in an area and unincorporated, for example, someplace, it doesn't fall under a library. Say like Rosemont with the Splines. They could pay, but they they pay an extremely high fee, like several hundred, but then they have to use the library like a, a resident. Well, the thing is that it's, um, I mean, just to bring up piggyback on that, the display is public library in Lancho because the residents, they can't burden their residents to pay for um, for anyone who's not within the district. They, they well, they're not a district at all. They're, they're municipal, so it's whatever it is. So yeah, whatever they right. Yeah. Right. Um, whoever yeah. made that decision, right. Right. they won't do it. So, I mean, it's because they, it's against their like the resident policy. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I'm just, but I'm just saying it's you're burdening your residents' tax monies yeah. and saying that they need to pay for. Mm -hmm. So, it really, it's, 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 it's tough. This is an extremely tough, tough decision. It is. Yeah, I really have to think of the residents. I can think of a lot of negatives. I can think of some positives, but I can think of most of the negatives pertaining to it. So uh, that's why if we can get more information of what other areas are doing and how it's working for them, it might give us something to jump off of. And we have to research that. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's really not, it's not like a pay, but the positive and negatives, it's just, I don't even know how to put it, it's just. Well, it opens up the door for You want yeah, it fair and, and and it's thoughtful for everyone on both sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. Huh. All right, so if we get some more information, sure. Okay. I, I can help you do that. Great. Thank you. All right, tonight we have a secretary's report. Uh, Diane, would you like to read that into the record? <laughs> a certified copy of the ordinance 19 04. An ordinance levying and assessing taxes of the Niles Main District Library of County, Illinois, for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2019, and ending June 30th, 2020, along with a certified truth and taxation certificate of compliance, was filed with the Cook County Clerk on November 21, 2019. The ordinance is available for public inspection. Thank you very much. All right, now I need a motion to approve the expenditure of $28,960.84 from the Special Reserve Fund for two new digital multifunction copiers from Kanika Minolta Business Solutions USA. Karen, do I have a second? I guess no, second anybody? because this is just to bring it up for us to discuss anyway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to approve the expenditure. Yeah, but and then we we'll discuss motion it. that right. we discuss right. it. Okay, I second it. Okay. Uh, the memo for this begins on page 47. Susan, can you sum up this request for us? And I will, before you even speak, point out that uh, second paragraph from the end uh, that the leasing option was considered in this proposal. Yeah, I mean we have we have two copiers that are under very they're copier printers. So, um, you know, the, your board packet was printed on one of them. They are under continuous and very hard use. Um, I think people try not to use them extravagantly, but for example, a school liaison going out into a school very often has written materials that they're handing out at the school and they're printing it up on the printer. And these copiers are, I believe, eight years old. Is that correct, Rich? So uh, they have. They have burned through their usable life to a very large extent, and it's beginning to eat up a lot of staff time. One of them is often out of commission, um, so it's time to do this. And uh, as we said, they did research 
leasing rather than purchasing and leasing it. And purchasing is actually a better deal for us. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. I don't know if Rich or Greg have anything they want to add. I just want to add that, um, you know, when we looked at when we looked at the uh, Conic and Minolta copiers work, we looked at the WISCA contract, NASPRO WISCA that we usually buy our technology stuff on. Um, all of those agreements and the RFPs that are let by that organization have been put online uh, in the board book. We didn't print them out here because it would have added about 200 and 10 pages or so of uh, additional materials. But you know, if you're interested in looking at you know the things that are behind us, I suggest you take a look at that. Um, second of all, um, we also looked at, at uh, Canon as a, as a competing uh, product, and uh, we found that the two replacement Canon Minolta's, first of all, are $10,000 less than the original cost of the current machine that we have in place. In place, so there's your technology curve. You know, it gets cheaper over time. Ten thousand less per machine. In total. Right. Uh, no. No. Oh. It shows twenty thousand. Twenty. Is it? Is it per machine? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was looking at total cost. Okay. It's total. Sorry. My fault. And uh, nearly fourteen thousand dollars less than the equivalent Canon mount. So kind of. Kind of the Minolta is the least cost uh, uh, choice for us to make uh, to replace the current kind of kind of the Minolta fleet, and the amount that uh, purchasing saves over uh, leasing over a five-year lease uh, is seven thousand five hundred dollars approximately. So, and you know the the fallacy about leasing is yeah you have a you know looks, looks like a lower monthly cost, but you always have int an interest rate associated with that. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the interest rate was around 13%, okay. as is what they're actually uh, using. Actually so. mm -hmm. On your payment? So the way, this, the way that it's structured is that you have an amount, okay? And let's say the amount is $28,960. And instead of writing a check, Basically, what you do is you write 60 checks, one a month, for five years. And because they are holding a note, essentially, representing the amount that they owe you, they charge you interest. It's the same as, as if you, uh, you know, bought a car or, you know, leased a car or leased a truck or, you know, lease uh, any piece of equipment. There's always an interest cost that's associated with it. And generally, over the lifetime, it ends up being, you know, ends up increasing the price uh, by some amount. In this case, it's seventy five hundred dollars. And at the end of that five year, what do we get out of it? Uh, at the end of the five year, you may buy the uh, piece of equipment for a dollar. You know, they're they're commonly referred to as sales type leases. Okay. You know, um, you know, which is, you know, basically the same as a purchase. And the other question is. If we buy them straight out, and you keep them for another six, seven, however long, did you say? I thought I remember you said before there's a company that buys the old equipment somehow, or are you? Well, in this case, uh, in the last paragraph, uh, we highlight the fact that um, we will be receiving a seven hundred and fifty dollar credit for each machine from Conoco kind of and Okay, so that's a uh, so fifteen hundred dollars total. But they're used up. I yeah, mean, that's know, what I'm they're, saying. They're, but you know, they're going to have to go through a significant amount of refurbishment in order mm -hmm. to, you know, sell them as used with any level of dependability. Because right now they aren't dependable. Okay. Thank you. And like, how long is our warranty on them? So as we use them, um, we continually have warranty. For oh, supplies, okay. toner, right. everything like we itself. Just added that one more to including paper. staples, except for paper. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I mean, but, just to kind of you know, because I mean, this is one of the lines that the Doherty's get on their um, questions. Okay. Just so that you know, I understand that maybe they can too. Um, so let's say okay. So the amount is what was it for twenty. Uh, 28,000. 28, okay, so you say 20,000. So for leasing, um, 
Did you figure that like the twenty eight thousand with the leasing would be like in five years, but we get to use it for eight years? So, so like we're like gaining three years, like that's how it was figured to like purchase rather than lease? No, what happens so every time uh, we print something, you know, we uh, we have what's called a click on the counter. Right. And each click results in a charge to us. Part of that is toner, part of that is warranty services, and you know, things of that nature. So what Rich was saying, as long as we have that service agreement in place, they'll come out and, and service it mm -hmm. under that agreement. The, the, the problem that we're, we're finding right now is that they're down so often that we have you know, we're losing staff productivity as Susan was saying. No, I understand that. So, um, you know, it's down, you have to find an alternative source to, uh, to print, go to another machine, right. send a job there. Uh, if you're sending it from a career, it might be confidential, of, mm -hmm. you know, to some, oh, you know, yeah, to some no, degree or something. Yeah. So, I mean, it yeah, creates a lot of gymnastics. One of, um, one of the uh, librarians uh, threatened to uh, break into uh, the defibrillator and uh, really give it a jolt <laughs> to try to resurrect it. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of frustration that's running high on the staff at this point. All right. I don't know if that answered my question. Um, Ask it again, I'll try. Okay. <laughs> um, my question was okay, so if you, all right, if you lease. Yes. And the lease was say a thousand dollars a month. Okay. Then you would it would be twenty eight months in order to pay. The, well, if you take a look at the second page, yeah, uh, the lease option Maybe that's specifies right. exactly what oh, your question is asking. Oh, okay, thank you. It's thirty six thousand four hundred eighty six dollars. Okay, because then I'm forty eight. Turn it over. Okay, great. That's what I'm looking for. So page 40. that cost there. That that's um, Hold on a second. Let me just get to it. Sure. Because I think that will clarify. Yeah. You know, I think that is what you need. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So under the lease option, kind of coming up to the last column, uh -huh. $36,486 would be the cost that we would incur ah, after I five see. years. After five years, our cost for buying them it's still twenty eight thousand nine hundred. Okay, that's exactly what I was asking. Right. So Thank if we you. use them for five years, it's still we are going to use them for more than five years. We're benefiting. So if at right. five years, we're already benefiting at seven thousand. Additionally, we'll benefit one dollar because to buy it out would be one dollar. Um, so overall, it's going to cost us less to buy it. Uh, we're taking it out of a fund that has that money specifically for technology and major. So we're really saving about eight thousand. By purchasing, because most likely we might get the same amount of time, eight years, maybe. Yeah, well, yeah. Like hoping. Yeah, well, seven we, or eight. Maybe. Like everything that we have, we service it and take care of it. And but even if it's just the five years, we're still up. We're still eight thousand right. dollars. So that's that's the answer, right? Right, there. and at the same so, time, you know, if we continue to try to use our existing equipment, right. it costs us more because okay. not only at the as Greg alluded, um, the staff wanting to maybe resurrect it during. Parts, uh, times that it's down, but the click cost is higher on older equipment. If you take a look at the click cost of our existing equipment, it's five cents for a color print and 73 hundredths for black and white, or 73 thousandths. For the new one, it goes down, and uh, down to f uh, four cents. Um, and you think, well, four cents, it's one cent different. It makes a lot of difference after two million copies. Um, if you add that a lot, and so uh, refurbishing it now makes more sense than trying to try to get one more extra year out of it. So we try to try like copiers. We look anytime you know between the six and seven year period of time. So this is our all well, upteamed upgrade of copiers over the last 25, 30 years. Um, and kind of into as uh, these copiers. Prior to this, were for cannons. Um, so those that last about eight years, these are uh, seven plus. So it's going to be eight years by the time we replace them. And then we hope to have another eight years on the, the replacements. Plus the fact that the staff are familiar with these models, um, the interface hasn't changed. So it's going to be less strange. Yeah, it's just interesting that, you know, because I mean, it, it's. 
I mean, I haven't done the research myself, but if they said that the other villages and everything are using leasing, it's very interesting that really it's advantageous to us to purchase sure. to being. I, you know, I will make this comment. Savvy. If mm -hmm. we were printing, say, 10 million copies mm -hmm. over a, say, two, three year period, then leasing would be more advantageous. Just like if you have a car and say you're a service provider for something and you're driving around and you're putting 20,000 miles on that car every year, as opposed to maybe five that you might be if you're just driving to work. Um, leasing is a better option in that case because that premium you're paying for funding of money also has the ability to get you a refresh car after a while, right? Because you're gonna have a lot of service. So perhaps in that scenario, but in our scenario, uh, we print a lot on them, but we don't print to that volume that would require us uh, to look at that leasing as maybe being more beneficial. Uh, because those individuals, uh, organizations, are replacing their copiers. So like maybe what maybe wasn't alluded to was how, what's the frequency of the replacement of the equipment? Is it every seven, eight years, or is it every three to four years? Right. And that's what and as a driving factor. It makes very much sense. I mean, right. working at a school makes a lot of sense because there's every two years we switch right. so them because of the for frequency. The most, mm -hmm. For the most and part, that makes sense to me. all our equipment that we try to purchase here, we try to extend the life as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So usually five years plus on and stuff. So yeah. that's why you'll see like the phone mm -hmm. system coming up to you seven plus years. Um, you know, a lot of things we try not push on this. Even computers, we'll try to get, like for computers, we'll try to extend the warranty on them. Uh, our server, we extend the next motion. We extended those for three years from the five year original. Um, but then you hit certain limits. Mm -hmm. The software is no longer compatible. Um, it's, the hardware is no longer going to be supported. It's end of life. And then you have to then reevaluate and go and uh, you know, purchase or lease or something. Well, thank you for your research. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. And thank yep. you for the explanation sure. for the non-tech savvy person over here. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, I think we all appreciate the explanation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The comparison is it really very does help. understandable. Thank you. Thank you. Scarf. Is that a roll? Oh, scarf. Oh. Anybody else? I, I have a Carol? couple. Sure. Um, regarding the purchase option, um, I believe the agenda mentions the twenty thousand nine hundred sixty and eighty four cents. I'm trying to understand um, the cost for the clips, the black and white, the color. Is that part of a contract? Is that why those are additional prices and it goes up to eighty one thousand? Yes. It's part of a service agreement. So when you purchase the copier, it automatically comes with the contract that includes these costs. Is that well, what you're saying? Um, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to accept it, but then you're buying um, toner on your own, and you know it's a lot messier. You probably end up with uh, as much cost, if not more, if you're you know if you're buying it piecemeal. Uh, this way, you know the uh, the service contract is embedded in the click rate. And all you do is pick up the phone and call them, and they show up and they fix the problem. Right, and and you have to get that regardless of leasing or buying. Oh, the service contract? Yeah. If, if you don't go. Well, you have to have something in place. Right. If you don't yeah. do that, then you're not going to be able to use the machine. So. Okay. And the service contract that you've outlined here includes toner and then what? The charge for color and black copies? Is that it? So the charge, if you make a color print or a black and white print, mm -hmm. includes the following. It includes the consumables of the machine, which include multiple toner cartridges, uh, multiple developer cartridges, fusers, uh, any, any part in the machine. The so cost those of, are covered based on your copies or the... Other based on the on usage of the machine. So if you make one print and it's a black and white and you're charged um, less than a cent and something happens with the machine and we call them out and it costs three, four hundred dollars, it's covered. If we've made a thousand uh, dollars worth of prints, black and white prints, and something happens, we're covered. We're covered as long as we continue using the machine. Okay, so, you're, so the charges for the 
color or black and white copies includes whatever toner so and other um, toner, staple, okay. consumable, and everything part of a paper. Okay, yes. and your service contract includes servicing the machine as well? Again, yes, everything is covered under the click charges. Yeah, service and consumables. Okay, and, and as long as you have the, the, the equipment, you have a service contract for service. Yes. And is that what you have on your current two copiers that we're replacing? Yes. So I'm trying to understand if we have a service contract on them, why are they in a state where they're having so many problems? So similar to a vehicle that is aged, um, you might have an extended warranty on it, but it's breaking because there's many parts. There, it's a complicated piece of technology um, or equipment. But they're eight years old, right? Is that what they you are, said? yes. Okay, and then my other question is, um, I don't see, well, then back to the cost of this. So actually, the cost of these two copiers is $81,000 not twenty eight thousand because we do have to get the contract right yeah it's total cost of ownership over a period of uh, projected eight years and again it's projected based on our current usage of the existing equipment okay so then my other question is did you obtain quotes from any other company since so this is all pre-bid. Uh, instead of trying to go out and have solicitation with bids we uh, have in the last 20 years used uh, national uh, public contracts. Uh, specifically, in this case, it's the NAPSCO, so it's the North American State Procurement Officers uh, Organization. And so it's a collection of all the state procurement officers of the United States of America. And they go out and have a lead agency that goes out to bid. Um, and they get much better pricing. If you take a look, um, I'm not sure if it is. So this here. national organization went out and picked up bids for you for our library here in Illinois? For any public organization. Um, so state, local, municipalities, special districts, park districts. So you don't you don't talk to these companies, you can't um you can't discuss their rates and lowering them or whatever. We and we actually got better rates uh, if you take a look at the partnership solution presentation, um, the rates that are agreed upon by uh, the bid uh, come out to uh, the bid charges are actually... What page are you on? Um, not sure which page this would be, first but it's... First versus uh, proposal, is that what you want? Or? That's what I'm looking at. Is that the contract price? I don't know. It would I don't be know. This? What, what is it called? Yeah, it's the hardware and service pricing. Thank you. So uh, the actual rates that we have are lower. Uh, so the 0 .0068, we're 0 .0060, and 0 .045, we're actually 0 .040. So they were able to go down on that for us. But like I said, if you take a look, the manufacturer price is just shy of 47000 for the same kind of equipment. I'm uh, not sure what you're looking at. I'm trying to figure out who are the competitors that submitted bids that we used to determine this was the best. So, like Greg alluded to in his opening statement about it, uh, we looked at Canon and Kai kind of off the contract, and on the second page, You looked at column. Canon and Minolta, did they submit a quote? So, with all the information that uh, was presented, like the 200 pages that Greg alluded to, in there you'll have the original RFP that went out to different manufacturers. So you, we issued an RFP for this? Uh, again, we are using a national pre-bid contract, which went out. So you did not submit, an, you did not have an RFP for any vendors around here? We did not do an RFP. We are using an RFP. That was, uh, we're a member of NAPSCO, so it allows us to use that, uh, any of their RFPs and any of their awarded. And bills. NAPSCO only deals with purchasing equipment? I'm sure they deal with many things. <coughs> things. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so we have many things that we are able to use. So okay, so you go to a specific Carol, group Carol, to get your Carol, information. Let him finish his statement. You keep well, no, he's, state. he's giving me a lot more information than I need. So what I'm learning is you go to this organization and they 
come up with bids or pricing for you, and that's so how you determine. So the organization it. is a members. It, it's an organization of state procurement officers, and in in terms of this particular thing that we're speaking about, and they have uh, organizations, uh, local municipalities. Uh, they can be special districts. Uh, they can be cities, uh, they can be the Niles Public Library, and they go out and uh, bid uh, for any kind of uh, equipment or services, um, and that is awarded and is available to any member organization. Um, we're a member organization, so we can take advantage of that. Uh, using these kind of uh, pre-bid contracts allows us to leverage a lot more savings than just going out ourselves. Uh, if you take a look, we did 2 million copies over an eight year period, which is absolutely zero compared to what trillions of copies that these organizations make, uh, state and local organizations off a contract uh, that's pre bid like this. So we get deep discounts. I believe, I think we're like 67% discount off of the oh, this close. price. Yeah for this equipment, which is phenomenal. So. so you believe that these are the best prices yes. you can get? we wouldn't have presented it otherwise. Because you have small quantities in comparison to other companies. Is that what you think? Is that what you're saying? In part, yes. Well, the idea is, is that you aggregate all of these together. So it's like dealing with a mega organization. That I, I understand that, but I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that um, by not really trying to engage with companies around here who would be dying for our business. I'm not so sure that I'm sending not sure it what to that means because I'm not aware of sending any local it to NASPO, companies like manufacturers. Sending the your bid through NASPO and letting them doing uh, do everything. It's almost like we're not. I don't know that we're um, allowing the library to connect with other businesses that may be willing to do even more for you. But let me just move on. So according to well, actually, this, I'm sorry, Carolyn. No, I'm we should confused. address that. I don't know if there are any local copier providing businesses. Well, I know for a fact um, that there are corporations that would never purchase um, copiers in today's age. There are many other options. And what like, I'm concerned like about what? is that our copier is eight years old. It's only a library. We have 48 full-time people, which isn't a lot, you know. So I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, how um, how beat well, up it seems to have gotten. Um, I think that's a poor choice of words. But what I'm getting at is leasing is definitely an option. But this one example, obviously, leasing isn't beneficial. But if all these other municipalities have found leasing to be beneficial, then I'm thinking we're missing a step, which is kind of like a red flag for me. Sure. But, what I'm, but what I'm also concerned about is we are getting a, a Conica Minolta, because you have a Conica Minolta, and you in, indicate here your seven-year historical clicks. Well, truth be told, what happened seven years ago isn't as valuable as what you're using the copiers for today in your usage. And sometimes I think rather than just replacing two pieces of equipment, maybe it's time to stop and take a thorough look at all of your copiers and figure out what they're being used for and reevaluate if needing to purchase two copiers of this size are really what the library needs. But we don't have any data. We have no idea what actually the library's copying needs are, or printing needs are. I and sure. I have in front of me only one one option, and it's, it's Minolta. I believe in front of you is the information that tells us what over a seven plus year period of time the library has done, and what kind of things the library needs out of the copiers, what the copiers are currently being able to do, and what the replacements are going to. We only have two staff copiers in the building. These are the ones we're, we're replacing. Um, I'm not sure that the information you're asking for is any more than whatever. So there are no other copiers in this building that for the staff. staff use? Nope. They, they just two. use these two? They do have yes. desk printers, and that's where almost all of the black and white copies go to. 
but there are no copiers available to the staff except these two. So and from time to time, you know, staff are like, well, could we have one on this level or this level? And we said, no, you know, they're pretty expensive. And with the discounts, you know, it's $14,000. Well, um, I mean, yeah. staff can run wherever they are. That's just part of, uh, and we've told of the them nature of it all, you know. Right. So, and I'm sure they're used to it right by now. But again, um, I would have preferred to see more than one quote. Um, I, I mean, sure. it's almost like we're just going to approve but, this. But again, this is out of a pre-bid contract. So... We chose the ones that fulfilled what we were doing. Um, I did look at the Xerox, and the Xerox models were a little bit uh, faster, a little bit slower, and didn't have any of the options um, that, like, like the booklet making, that would uh, fulfill all these qualifications. So I'm not going to present to you something that's even much more expensive on a completely different scale than what we're looking for, just so there's a third column. So we presented you with the two columns that had uh, equivalent models, so the, con the Canon and the Konica, uh, which we did the last time, uh, you know, eight years ago. Uh, at that time, we had Canon, um, and we found that Konica Minolta at 38,000 was going to be cheaper, um, and the board suggested or approved that recommendation. This time around, uh, I was actually surprised that Konica Minolta is actually even less than it was last time. So um, it's all in front of you. And again, like the leasing thing, um, you know, if we did not have the money or we did not want to allocate the money towards it, then I guess we could do a lease option and pay more. Uh, well, no, I think there are other lease options available where you wouldn't have to pay more, but obviously we don't right. have those options in front of us. Yeah, Carolyn, I, I, I'm, But I think one I'm... other suggestion is, um, a lot of companies even purchase refurbished copiers that sure, um, are in excellent condition and wouldn't cost this much. Does right. this for the qualifications that we require, there is nothing available for us. Um, the stuff that's available is somewhere around 25 to 30 copies per minute. Doesn't not have the booklet making this, the finishing uh, options that the library uses. And is that because you went through this? Um, Napsco and they don't so Napsco does not doesn't work with refurbished. They work with manufacturers, so it doesn't go out to uh, perhaps a small business or you know, that might be local somewhere and they're reselling copiers. They go directly to the manufacturer. So they go to Canon USA, Konica Minolta, Xerox, and some other uh, copier manufacturers. So you get the service from the factory, and you don't have to go through like an independent or a third party. Well, actually, it's all about cost and pricing, and there, I, what I'm trying to say is there are other options. This is a very narrow um, view of how to purchase a copier, but I understand it's what you do, it's who you go through. Um, I just want to say that there are many other options that we could have um, investigated, but it's just not part of who you use. Um, and there are still refurbished copiers that could accommodate you with your bookmaking and everything else because I know I use them. So, um, all right, well, thank you for that. I just wanted to add, just from my perspective on what they've said, going through NASCAR doesn't seem like a narrow point of view and a very narrow perspective. So I just wanted to add that. Great. Any other trustee comments on this well, issue? Well, I appreciate all the work that and I did too. Uh, Thank, Thank you. Thank you to give us this information. Quite the turn. Oh, great. Okay. All right, Diane, would you please take the roll? Okay, Karen. Yes. Carolyn. No. Diane. Yes. Patty. Yes. Linda. Yes. Ted. Yes. Uh, next, we need a motion to approve the expenditure. I'm sorry, excuse me, $127,784.36 from the Special Reserve Fund for the 2019-2020 Server and Storage Area Network Virtualization Infrastructure Refresh Project. Do I hear a motion? I make the motion. I can make a motion. 80 seconds. Great. Memo for this begins on page 67. I think Greg has told us a little about this project last month. Mm -hmm. Does I have any, anyone have any questions for Greg or Rick? <coughs> okay. 
precious on this bridge. One of the two, please. Okay. Uh, so, about eight years ago, the library uh, went through an initiative to evaluate uh, our servers um, and the support infrastructure for all of the technology in the library, namely uh, PCs, there was no Macs at the time, um, and we found that uh, virtualization was going to be the key for us to uh, bring in costs uh, of server platforms, at the same time uh, allow the library to expand uh, whenever the need presented itself during the service life of the equipment. Uh, namely, when, uh, say, a new service comes in um, two, three years after a, a server is purchased, uh, if it's a standard physical server that runs an operating system on it, like Windows Server, um, you can add different functionality to it, but at some point you start taxing that machine. Or if you need to do service, for example, install something new, you take the server down from its regular duties, uh, which impacts everything that that server is supporting. Uh, virtualization allows you to use a piece of physical hardware, which is typically called a server, as what we call a host. So it will uh, have a virtualization uh, operating system on it, which will allow multiple Windows Server, Linux, whatever uh, flavor of server operating system uh, exist in independent uh, instances on that. So think of at home, you might have one computer, a tablet, maybe you have multiple computers. Think of this being one box that supports all those independent computers uh, running on it, um, as opposed to physically having all this separate hardware or having to buy it every single time uh, a new platform or something that you're uh, trying to support. Um, so eight year, uh, so five years went by. We purchased uh, originally with five year uh, support uh, for those units. Uh, we bought three physical hosts uh, uh, that were uh, for the virtualization and then one physical host just for a domain and backup server. Uh, a storage area network for the virtualization to work. Um, part of the design is that if any piece of hardware fails, there's a backup. Um, so we have three hosts, and if any one of those fails, uh, you can have two of the hosts run uh, most of the servers. Uh, in order for that to be accomplished, you need a appliance that stores all the data, and that's what that SAN is, the storage area network. And then a uh, auto loader for backing up and archiving uh, the backups of all this. Uh, so five years went by, uh, we came to the board uh, three years ago and uh, approved, the board approved a three-year extension. We could have gone with a five-year, but we started to see guidance from uh, not the manufacturer in terms of support, because that was going to be five, but from VMware, which is the platform that we use for virtualization, that the sunset uh, on supporting this equipment is going to come uh, in three years. So we said, well, we're not going to pay five years to HPE and have for equipment that we can't use in three years. So the board approved the three year. Um, we are now three years in, and we're looking at replacing all that because the sunset date on the equipments, the, the, the support of that equipment from the software side of it, the OS side, is ending uh, at, in the spring. Um, so we, we looked at uh, basically going like for like. So we're replacing everything that we have. The only difference is that the SAN has one less piece of a physical equipment because drive technology uh, capacities have increased. So now they're 2.4 terabytes as opposed to 900 gig. Um, so we only need one shelf as opposed to two. Um, and what you have before you is the uh, contract, pre-bid contract, actually two pre-bid contracts. One is uh, the NAPSCO, which we used last time. Uh, and this time around, our hardware vendor, CWG, found that uh, a newer uh, uh, national IPA uh, contracting group uh, had better pricing. Um, so, uh, and they've merged recently with something called Omni Partners Public Sector uh, to make them even larger organization. 
So that gave us a, a better price in terms of the hardware. So you can see that listed out um, in comparison uh, there. Uh, and then lastly, I don't stand up SANS on a daily basis. So uh, the storage area network, uh, it, there is a set of a set of setup procedures that you have to do um, that would take me much longer to educate myself and make sure it's done right on production equipment um, as opposed to having a professional come in that deals with that type of technology on a daily basis. Um, so we have uh, we went out to look at the original uh, consultant that I believe it was like shot the shy of 60 grand we paid the first time uh, back eight years ago. Uh, this time, literally 90% of the work is going to be me and Greg McGowan. Uh, so standing up the equipment, racking, stacking, configuration, upgrades and firmware, uh, compatibility, testing, uh, certification that the hardware is performing operationalized before we put it into production. Um, what they're going to help us out with is standing up the SAN and the data migration plan between the two, the old SAN and the new SAN. So that is the cost. And um, Peter's came out in a little bit higher uh, in Vertec, which we've actually used both for uh, the technology. Uh, so Peter's originally uh, set up all the equipment, or helped actually set up all the equipment. Uh, Vertec came in uh, a few years ago when we presented to the board that we need to upgrade the controllers of the SAN in order to uh, continue to upgrade the virtualization software to a supported version. Uh, that came before the board and Vertec was the lowest quote with that and we'll conti we continue to work with them on, uh, uh, on this project. Any questions? I know it's a lot of stuff and it's very complicated. Yeah. So, so, uh, stuff. so, Rich, yes. so uh, the expected life the, the life expectancy for the new equipment is approximately, we're looking at another eight years, do we think? I would say yes. Uh, I found over the years, we've typically gone eight to ten years on equipment. Um, but nowadays, with the virtualization factor in there, um, you don't just have the OS that you have to kind of work on and, and the hardware. Usually the hardware for like HP does a great job. They will give you ten years. But if they, you know, they're not just putting Windows on it. So we can continue probably running Windows, uh, some older version on it, but with the virtualization software, they're, you know, cutting some of that stuff because it won't support some of the technology that's on the older right. server, so, yep. yeah. It happens to everybody. Um, is there any E-rate funding, grant funding on this that can be used for the... Uh, no, so what we were able to do in the narrative, uh, Greg and I put in, um, the funding for E-rate were things like the switch that is a, a central factor in all of this so all the things can communicate. Um, and that we got 80% uh, E-rate funding for and that was a 20 some thousand dollar purchase, uh, total purchase, so 80% of that was from E-rate. The UPS is, of course, is a component to make sure everything continues working. But that switch needs to be replaced? Uh, it was already approved, oh, and okay. it's oh, I understand. Okay. putting it in. Um, okay. So those things, yes. E-rate category one is uh, data communication, um, so we take advantage of that. Category two is uh, expanding that data into the building, right? So things like switches, uh, communication switches for the data, access points that are around the building that we've gone over, uh, we purchase, uh, uh, cabling, data cabling, uh, those are all considered covered services and there's like a plethora of stiff stuff you have to go through sure. and make sure you're qualified for. Uh, but coincidentally, filtering, which is a precursor to getting E-rate, is not covered. Not the equipment, not anything. So it's, I have no idea why the front of the road did that. Um, so we, you know, we pay for that. Actually, we're going to be paying forty-five hundred dollars for a five-year renewal on that uh, coming up, so that we can maintain the filter and maintain getting the. You know, we've gotten about fifty grand per year in the last yeah. fifty and sixty. Uh, so four the, uh, years. Last three years, four years, four years. Yeah, four years, like fifty grand per year, I think. I think so. Is there any concern on any other current software? that might not run on the new Well, the, what's, what's absolutely wonderful about this is that we're going to migrate existing servers to the new cluster. 
So the, the three devices, three servers that constitute hosts, um, they run all those 27 virtualized uh, servers. So most, the majority are Windows-based platforms, so a, a version of Windows Server. Um, there's a few Linux boxes on there. Dave's uh, HVAC, part of his HVAC, HVAC solution for the buildings, HVAC is Linux based. Um, and there's some appliances, um, appliances being their pre structured Linux software pieces. May I have your that, attention, please? That uh, uh, the reseller will purchase and then we install. Um, into the virtualization. So that all just moves over and okay. it's supported. So okay. and it supports everything that we currently have in okay. the current cluster. Um, and the version that we're going to go to, we're at 6 for ESXi host right now. We're going to go to 6.7. <coughs> um, and it opens us to the possibility of expanding to the latest versions because the current version won't even let us run like 2016 or 2019 server. So okay. So we're kind of stuck at 2012 okay. servers. So. Okay, does anybody else need any more numbers from Rich? I just had a question. Does anyone else have uh, Anybody yeah, else? I, no, go ahead, Carol. Okay, All right, right Diane right. first. Go ahead. Diane, let's go first. I'm just reading the on page 68 of consulting. So yes. you, the IT department, is doing all the work, right? The majority of the work, yes. And then you are, you have employed Vertex. For your We're requesting yes. To um, to help you to with assist any, us. Yes. Anything that you might need help with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not included in this cost up here. It is. It is up at the top. If you look at if you look at uh, you know on page sixty seven, it's like the second paragraph here. Oh. Okay. There's a, a cost of vertex that's added in oh, for the total. Um, you know, to give you uh, an idea, eight years ago, uh, we spent almost $170,000 uh, for the equipment and the consulting mm -hmm. to uh, to bring up this, you know, configuration that we're running at. Mm -hmm. you know, so, it's a, you know, so, you know, a little more uh, technology for roughly the same price in terms of hardware but a lot less in consulting because of, uh, you know, Rich's uh, experience with it allows him to, you know, take, you know, harvest, you know, low hanging fruit. So that, uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be a lot of meetings and we can, so, yeah. Rich, are confident that you'll be able to do this, you and Greg will be able to Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we're counting on you. Good well, everyone from the board on no, yes. I understand. No pressure. <laughs> on, a, on a daily basis, so that's how it is. Why did I get this email from, oh, hey, the server needs some work or an update, or, or Microsoft released something that yes. uh, shouldn't have been released, and got that, it right. got pushed out automatically. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you have to yeah. worry about all sorts of things. Linda, did you have something? No. no. Carolyn? Yeah, I had a question. So the, the reason we're doing this is because um, what we have now, the virtualization we have now won't run newer versions, is that? Right, so we're stuck at version 6, mm -hmm. and that will end support. Um, I believe it's, I don't know if it's March 31st exactly, or it's like March 23rd or something like that. Ending support, you mean like warranty, is that what you support, mean? Support, as in uh, I come in or I get an alert that the servers are down and I need to contact um, VMware, and they're like, oh, well, we don't support that because that version is end of life. Okay, so and all twenty-seven servers are down, and no one can use any of the computers or resources in the entire building. So it has nothing to do with the period of time. They just won't be handling that anymore. So you have no choice. Well, it does have a period of time. They support it from the day it was released to X amount of days uh, or years, and then they did an extension on that, and that extension ends at the end of March. Spring of twenty twenty. Okay, right. so that. That's how that goes. Um. And so we've known this, and that's why we elected to only spend for three years of renewal on the hardware, because, like I said, the hardware would, uh, HPE would allow us to go five years on the hardware, but we can't run the software, so, you know, I, I could say to the board... It's like the gas won't work. 
right, I can say to the board, well, you know what, let's try to get 10 years. Try to get two more years, go back, I don't know, maybe like 10, 12 grand maybe, um, in terms of the hardware to get the hardware support, and we'd be covered on hardware. But something happens with the software, or I can't run something that requires Windows Server 2016 as a platform, because version six doesn't allow me to run that. And now I'm going to be coming to the board going, well, I need to get a physical server, add that box, and get 2016 on it just so I can run the service because the virtualization platform doesn't support it. Yeah. So we knew this going up front. That's why, you know, it's not, this is not something we do blindly. It's a strategic move. We have a strategic plan as when we're replacing equipment, how long we can try. Um, once in a while, a software manufacturer or a hardware manufacturer will throw a monkey wrench into the works. Sure. Intel uh, threw a monkey wrench into a lot of people's plans, specifically on server, high-end servers. So, you know, it is expensive what we're buying, certainly. You know, if I were to say, whoa, we're, we're buying a $20,000 server, but we're getting a single chip with 16 cores, those servers support multiple chips, and, you know, 32 cores, I think, per per chip. So we're at the high of the of the low end of the stuff. Um, so you know, we do everything that we possibly can to plan for these things, and that we for you is what we've come up with. So. And and you also sent this out to bid. So again, we went and looked at pre-bid contracts because we know that going out to bid for these types of things. Uh, when we did that in 1997, um, we sort of got stuck with whatever was the lowest fruit, uh, and it kind of, you know, fulfilled for the most part what it had. I'm sorry, you got stuck with what? We got stuck with the servers and the solution that was provided as the lowest bid uh, at the time. And since then, things like NAPSCO and NISCA and National IPA have become available to us, and we find that using those, the leverage of those large contract organizations uh, or large volume uh, of purchases allows for the best hardware to be at the lowest possible cost without us trying to invest in something that we don't have, which is uh, buying power, right? We can no, buy $116,000 of servers, uh, we can't buy a couple of billion. And those contracts, uh, their sales are in the billions. So, and um, once again, um, it's through this this national IPA is okay. this, the particular one that we're using, so which now is Omni Partners. <coughs> Greg, you uh, gave the copies of all the uh, national IPA information and the yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, you know uh, the the, uh, the bidding. Uh, Part of this and, and everything is online uh, in board books. So if you want to, you know, read about the uh, request for proposal and the resulting bids that this organization got, you can print them online. I didn't want to print them because, again, they're, they're pretty voluminous. Oh no, and I'm not asking you to. I, I appreciate it. I, I'm just trying to figure out if um, anyone wanted to bid on whatever the library is purchasing. We wouldn't even entertain that because you already go through some conglomerate, it seems. We're going to a volume there. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for that. Great. Right. Uh, Eddie, anything? To me, that being able to be in this group where we're considered a big and we're getting so much of this kind of thing, it's like, I'm going to bring you. Great. Great. Dan, would you take the roll, please? Karen? Yes. Carolyn? I'm going to abstain. Diane? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Ted? Yes. All right, I understand that Greg has gotten some information about the condition of our roof and a presentation about it. Greg.
here you should have uh, two copies, uh, one with the picture of the library in front of it, uh, in front of it and then the second one which is the presentation, which uh, I'm going to go through now. So this is uh, the brief discussion on the uh, agenda. Okay. So, so on uh, December 5th, um, we were able to uh, get a um, an engineer, a uh, building envelope consultant, to come out and take a look at uh, at the roof before. We had FAQ come out and they took a look at the roof as part of uh, a larger uh, project and they spent a minimal amount of time on the roof but also in the basement of the building and around the exterior looking at um, all different uh, components. Uh, this, uh, this inspection was solely focused on the building, uh, on the roof of the building and its condition. We spent several hours examining all seven levels of the roof. Uh, spent additional time reviewing original plans and uh, service invoices that uh, were try provided uh, to him subsequently. Uh, this is the person that charges a fee for their service, and they are uh, they have no financial interest or potential financial interest in any action taken by the library. And you can see there that uh, the fee that we paid uh, this man uh, was just over three thousand dollars. Um, once he left, he compiled this report and delivered it on the 10th. Oops. Um, in his report, he uh, summarizes uh, the two groups that, that are of question. There's a third group that's also included in this report that he took a look at, and that's the copper standing seam roof, which uh, is on top of the uh, turret on the corner of the building, but I excluded it here because uh, this is not what we're talking about for this particular project. Um, there are two roofs, uh, the east roof and the west roof. Uh, the west roof is uh, a 1998 installation, uh, which is uh, which coincided with the 1998 edition. Uh, just for orientation, we're sitting in the 1998 edition right now. Uh, they uh, put a 60 mil thick membrane with an R30 insulation factor um, on the 1998 edition. Uh, had a 20 year warranty, so as of 2018, we were out of warranty. And basically what that means is um, any uh, repairs or chasing of leaks or anything like that uh, is uh, completely on our dime, out of our pocket and uh, there's no warranty to apply that to at this point. The East Roof uh, is a 2003 installation. Um, for point of reference, the East Roof is uh, the roof over the old library. Um, it was first built in 1964, I think. Um, and uh, that roof was a 45 mil thick, so it's a thinner uh, membrane and also has an R30 insulation. Um, it had a 15 year warranty and it was out of warranty in 2018 as well. Can I ask a question? Or can I? No, wait? please. Okay, my question is, is it a shorter a warranty because of the fact it's a lesser uh, thickness of membrane? I think that's part of it. I, um, I don't know what other uh, considerations uh, there were. They may have wanted to make the two line up, both being 2018. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think there's a number of considerations, so I could. Because there's quite a bit of a difference in thickness mm -hmm. between 60 and 45. That's right. So, um, you know, the observations uh, that are in the report are that the uh, maintenance routines uh, that we've employed over the years have helped to extend the roof life. Um, there's a softness of roof insulation in isolated areas around the roof, especially around the chiller. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't happen suddenly. This was noticed, uh, uh, noted previously and we were aware of it and keeping an eye on it. Uh, typically, the uh, softness of the insulation indicates the presence of moisture, uh, which you know certainly compromises the effectiveness of the insulation. Mm -hmm. So, if you you know if you think about it, you know you need a lot of uh, you need your insulation, you need the air in the insulation in order to insulate the building. If that gets wet, 
you know, compacts and it just doesn't do its job. Uh, and then, you know, uh, the uh, presence of moisture may lead to mold, and nobody wants mold in the mm -hmm. uh, public building. The uh, conclusions and recommendations in the report, uh, the roof is at the end of its intended service life. Um, there are increasing membrane deficiencies. Basically, uh, you know, we see more leaks, we see more issues, chalking and things like that. Um, the bonding adhesives that are that are used to actually glue the membrane to the substructure and caulk its edges to make it waterproof um, are expected to start to fail. Mm -hmm. So while it may look good, the underlying, um, the underlying effectiveness of the adhesives is uh, starting, uh, starting to come into question. Um, <coughs> failure rates and locations of failure rates are difficult to predict. Nobody can predict those. And chasing leaks will become a major focus uh, of, of maintenance uh, on this roof. So what that means generally is as much as we're up on the roof and trying to make sure that you know, everything is in good shape, uh, we may suddenly see a leak appear, let's say, in this room, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, then what uh, Dave has to do is work with a contractor in order to start here and then trace it back up to the, to the roof and then figure out what he has to do, uh, what he has to do to remediate it. Uh, the recommendation is that the roof, uh, the entire roof membrane, be recovered in the uh, in the near future, um, which involves removing the the membrane and some of the other components, but the membrane is the main one. Repairing the insulation where necessary, uh, bolstering the substructure to enhance uh, drainage. Um, there are uh, several spots on the roof where water collects. Mm -hmm. Uh, so basically what you need to do is put something under the membrane to lift it up mm -hmm. so that water sheds to the correct uh, mm -hmm. you know, places and is drained from the roof. And then uh, repair the miscellaneous components and install the new membrane. Um, the next steps that, that we'd like to see uh, or that we're all recommending is that we should uh, engage the consultant to actually now knows our roof and, and knows the you know, basic con uh, construction of the roof, engage him to help us write technical specifications leading to an RFP to uh, solicit bids, uh, issue the RFP to roofing companies and trade associations uh, for a period of time, and then uh, open the bids, select a roofing company, and schedule the project. Um, I'll take questions. I somewhat understand this situation because of flat roofs. I used to have a flat roof. And I know, yeah, if you don't watch the pitch, and it, it will deteriorate after time. You have to have it redone so you have to pitch. Otherwise, you have a disaster. So I understand a lot of what you're saying. Any? Karen, you have any? Well, I was going to create a green roof on top of the roof. Who has suggested it? Other people are excited about the idea. Put a green roof. You're, you're still going to need to get, get a new roof if you're going to put a green roof on it because you're going to have to protect the interior of the building from the green roof. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. But I didn't know if, you know, if that's something that should be done, if that should be done at the same time. If you're putting a roof on it. You know, my question pertaining to the What? I'm sorry, what's the difference? What color roof? No, it isn't. She means living stuff. Oh. Like oh. weeds and stuff? Like, like they have downtown. Like the rules from my gutters right now. So you got to worry about the tonnage as, as well, the structure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. How much of the structure is going to stand. Uh, but, you know, I've been up on a um, number of roofs uh, up in North Chicago. They open up a lot of buildings. They have put green roofs on their mm -hmm. roofs downtown mm -hmm. and near Source Side North. And a lot of them have green roofs up there. They let you walk around. Great. So I mean, a lot of large buildings do put green roofs up there, or and or solar panels. So as long as we're doing this, I'm just wondering, you know, are you thinking about that too? We have a, we have a truss roof though. How you doing? The, the old library. Mm -hmm. There's actually a truss roof. 
And you'd have to be very careful on what you put on that because those trusses could, where, where you did some of the work where you put the new air handler when they hung that in there, they had epoxy all the trusses in order to withstand weight. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the southwest corner? Yes, the right, right, or uh, the barrel roof right here on the second floor. The barrel roof, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a truss roof. Kid yeah, space. and kid space is a truss roof as well. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful how much you put on that because that would be, that, that wood is <coughs> quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Plus it's only, it's only just um, seal up there. Yes. There's no concrete, so is, yeah. the load out in the roof is minimal right. in terms of right. what it can be displaced. Right. And as far as solar panels, aren't they doing, and I'm just picking off of what she said, aren't they doing the specials now for for uh, people or businesses that put solar panels on it? And what benefit would it even do? That's something that's never really been brought up. But if you look at, um, I was at a, a seminar once in the, uh, the high school, and they were talking about they have solar panels at the high school. Uh huh. Which you one? Have the to, um, no, right down there, no, west. west. Yeah. Uh, and um, they were explaining how much footage of solar panels you would need to run just the interior lighting mm -hmm. in the building. Mm -hmm. You don't have enough room at all. Well, uh, yeah. But well, it doesn't have to be a total effect. replacement. Right. No, right. right. But I mean, if you'd want, I mean, if you're going to go to that expense, you're going to spend all that money for all that. Um, you want the benefit. You want the benefit of yeah. being, you know, having to pay for it. Mm -hmm. so. Plus, we need we need to make room for the batteries. Yeah, <laughs> we have no <laughs> room for the batteries. Yeah. We have no room for anything. So. Okay. Unless you hang them. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Interesting. I have no concept about how solar panels work. So this does not address uh, a green roof. Well, I, I see that. I was just wondering if any consideration was given to that. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I mean, when we first were talking about it, just in the summer, we, like it was, this, this sounds like we need a home to grow. If you're, we're, before, it didn't sound like maybe we needed a home to grow, but now that we actually have this, evaluation, it sounds like you do need a whole new roof. I just want to differentiate. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just... Uh, sometimes, sometimes people look at a whole new roof yeah. as stripping off everything, including the insulation. What the suggested, suggestion here is, is removing the membrane, preserving the insulation, but repairing the soft areas oh, so okay. that, you know, to a, a level consistent with, you know, the good insulation, and then putting a reinstalling uh, a membrane. Okay, okay, so keeping what is good, but repairing everything that needs to be repaired. So it's not a whole new room. Correct. It's, it's just fixing everything yeah. that needs to be fixed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The top layer would be the top okay. layer. Okay. Um, and, and the current request is to create an RFP. It's not to spend any funds because right. we have no. We don't even have we any, any bids yet, so okay. we have no idea. Yes. So right. I guess my only question would be that, because um, you did say that you were going to still use this um, person, then to help you once the RFP, RFPs come in, then they'll help you evaluate? Well, he'll, he'll help write the RFP. Right. I'll write it. He'll write the technical specs. The technical specs. Uh, uh, right. My expectation is, as yours is, that he will help evaluate you know, right. whether uh, the bids were appropriate to the specifications that he writes okay. uh, to, to ensure that we're not giving up anything or shortcutting okay. you know, something. Okay. Um, I know I spoke. But it's, listening to don't her. Don't look at me, look at me. Listening to her, I got another idea. Is it okay or should I wait until the end? No, I don't want to. I don't want to. You don't want to read on my page? I don't want to read on your page. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. You get to read that enough. <laughs> so, okay. I think I. Uh, I'm finished. She's finishing. Eight. I guess I didn't ever realize that there was seven levels to it. There's seven There's seven, like seven levels. Levels. You know, and um, I mean, that's what we have. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like in here, I think. Mean, yeah. yeah, I okay. All right, thank you for the I, clarification. I remember hearing before that the specs for 
the building or for the roofs is that they have to get an R30. Right. But are there new specs pertaining to the membrane and the thickness of the membrane? Does it have to be a 60 or 45? Or do you know that answer? Um, I don't know that. I think, I think the uh, thicker, you, you, you pay for the thicker membrane. It's whatever you, what your pocket can afford. Okay. You can go up higher on the but meter. usually thicker like this, yeah. I would think, would have a little bit longer life, life expectancy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Life expectancy. Right. Okay. So that's interesting. And we'll mm -hmm. see what the price value between the two would be. You know, is it worth pay, it to uh, pay the extra for the 60 versus the 45 that we have on there? I'm just looking at those two thicknesses. Yeah. yeah. Well, my, expect my expectation. Uh, would be to go for like a 20 year uh, warranty life. Okay, which bag, makes which, sense. Which would, um, which, would bag, which would bag a, uh, a 60 or maybe more, you know, depending on what they're, you know, what they're off and current. It makes sense. You know, you want as long a warranty as possible. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh, I just had a simple question. What company is Tony Whittington with? He's uh, with himself. He's a uh, independent. He's independent. He's a consulting. I, for, I, I forget what he uh, calls himself. Oh, okay. He's yeah. a yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, building, building and the building consultant. Right. And where's he from? Madison, Wisconsin. All right, thank you. And how did you find this individual? I called an engineering firm. And he was recommended by him. Our engineering firm? That means? Just an engineering firm in general. I oh. picked one up out of the book and I opened it up okay. and I was following <laughs> what I wanted to do. And he suggested this gentleman would be uh, somebody who does that type of work. All right, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, any other? Mm -hmm. I used to be more people. Yes, not. Okay. Uh, all right. Are we. So we're not, we're not taking a roll on this? No, it would just be because there's nothing to vote on. Sure. It's just we're looking for direction. For what I, you want I, to do. I would say that the board is giving you the okay to go ahead and create the RFP. The, the decided vote that I'd really like to see the Rick Green ones can say too. Is that all possible? Of course, you didn't even have to have access to it. You'd have to build the whole infrastructure yeah. to get up there. Yeah. And you've got liability and people falling off the roof. Companies do it. Lots yeah, but they do when they, they rebuild and it. We've got, we got, got a nice garage roof over it, not as huge as the rest of the roads. So the staff and it actually has sunny with steel, steel structure. Yeah, that might yeah, support it. It's a little bit of a green garage. Sun strong. This is the wave of the future. This is what we should be doing. Like the gardening. This is what we should be doing. We're missing a chance. And then this is a chance. And then we have the gardening plan to take care of us. I can just see that. See, OSHA here with no fence around. Where's the fence? I had part of the seed on my roof for the whole summer and never went here. It's fine. Well, make your make your case. Come back with information and Okay, uh other. So I do have some other I hate to uh, it's that meeting. What about the D oh, was the attorney in the beginning? We did that. We moved oh, that yeah, up. Yes. Right. He is done. So um uh, I, a couple of things that I want I want us to consider. Uh, uh, first of all, how do we like the double sided board packet so far? Perfect. Thank well, you. There's a lot of paper. So I'm, 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 I would like us to consider as a cost saving measure to uh, go with a digital board page. Just think that through. We, we I mean, know people, you know, the village does it now, they have their, their tablet or their PC. Yes. If we can get tablets, all. sure. You know, we, we've already went down right now. We tried that ten years, we ten did. years ago. It's like every day. We, and, and the board was everyone tablets. Yep. Right. And uh, every meeting, one less person brought their tablet to meeting. It just did not fire. Was it a problem with people forgetting their tablets? No. Uh, or at least one person, the board president at the time, decided that he really liked to write notes on his paper. Well, he is gone. 
Well, we have a new sheriff in town. Sheriff yeah, in town. Yeah. Um, people just really didn't like it. Did you, you not like it? I didn't have like it. You did not like it. I did not like it. And I found that other people were not bringing their tablets, not using them. It was difficult to look at the uh, text and the report. And uh, it just, uh, I, I thought it was a shame because the district did spend a fair amount of money on those tablets, which... They still were good for checking email and things like that, which was also part of the purpose. But yeah, we were not able to go. They were free at that time. Tablets are better now, so... Yeah. Many, many library boards do go pay for free, but I'm not ready. I would just like to see less <coughs> configuration, specifications, all this paperwork that we didn't read or need. So, well, besides, how can we get a part of it online? And so maybe we could do more of that, just refer you to board things. For some of the stuff, yeah. yeah. But the basic stuff, I kind of, I don't like paper. I don't like paper. I'm too old to I have nothing to do with paper. Okay. Right. Not 200. I, I keep forgetting to bring mine in. That, okay. That's it fine. Does, it does. It doesn't really do that. I, I just wanted to bring it up because okay. it seemed like. Thank you. Except for bringing it up. Um, um, yes. All right. Um, uh, Carolyn, you had put the request for the agenda item. But let's go over our procedures for that. I think we had wanted that to go through the president for a request for our agenda items. Do you have the word? I, I, I think it's I think it says both, either the director or the. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah. I, stand, I stand corrected. Mm -hmm. I, I apologize. But the the director can make a decision to put it on or not, or to talk to the president, put on that, put on. If it's not something that is a board decision or anything. Uh, like that. I think it was more to do with the asking for information with the information requests that, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. that were not related yeah. to the agenda or to go to the board. Okay. I stand corrected on that. I stand corrected on that. All right. Um, and then I want to ask uh, the board for something. We used to um, provide the staff with a holiday item for three or hundred dollars or something out of the trustee budget, I believe. Is it a lunch or uh, yeah. I'm just thinking it would be really nice. We have a, a goodly amount. We haven't spent hardly anything out of our trustee budgets. And it just seems to me it would be really nice provided cookie trays or something that would just show our appreciation to the staff for all the hard work that they do. I'm just I'm just bringing this up as an idea of the yeah, as to um, decide on. Yeah, I don't know if that I think we used to do something like that many years ago and mm -hmm. then it was it was stuck. Um, I can't remember the details of what the French used yeah. to find out for like dinner with Yeah, I'm not, I'm not I'm not suggesting that. I'm just like suggesting that. That. That if we do a couple of trays from oh, different did departments. We, did we do something at Thanksgiving? Yeah, it, we, yes. that was Well, that was us. We just that collected it. Right. 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 That was out of my personal budget. Yeah. And uh, so I had to have breakfast. So right. That's very nice. That's really the other issue. Oh, okay. Um, and again, I don't have any objections to that. I think maybe doing it a little later in the spring, just because we did, just did something a couple of weeks ago for the breakfast. Ah. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking they Christmas. They have staff day, yeah. is it in January, staff where they're having a staff day? To me, that would be a well, reasonable be nice. time to do it for the staff day. All right. Or February, well, staff day, then you hit everybody. Somebody said, well, yeah, exactly. library day. Yeah. Staff day, everybody's here, so do it for them. Okay. Or for National Library Week. Or yeah. National That's Library Week could be another reasonable time to do it. When is that? February, April. April. Oh, Love Your Library is is February. That National Library Week is April. Okay, I knew there was one in February. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's good. That's why I'm bringing it up for discussion. It just it just seems like I'm not you know I'm not asking for a lot of money. Just something that's uh, a nice couple of trays or something that, that shows. Yeah, that I think that's a very good idea. From the trustee budget. Yeah, and then uh, take it out of the trustee. Is that what we allowed to do that? No. Well, there was an issue with that, but I think it was really? because the amount was in the thousands. Oh, uh, and so they stopped it. Oh, but remember, there's a there's there's controversy about using tax dollars 
for feeding staff. That's something like in corporations, you can't use you can't use um, corporate money. But like years ago, the soda machines they used to give you money or something. So corporations or schools used to you use that have. money. You can't take money out of your budget to feed staff. It's usually the principal's budget or some specific money. No, but it's not budget money. It's not tax dollars money. I, I, I don't know anything about not feeding staff that I've not heard, but at one point um, they were giving staff gift cards at Christmas, oh, and that's what the lawyer yeah, said. Oh, yeah. that, could, that could go to oh, so that's gift cards. That's right. cash, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it was a, it was a large amount. I, I know it was something I just can't. Right. Well, a couple of trays can't cost yeah. that much. All right, let's let's bring it up then, Dick. Can we do? Yeah. We can't, we're not going to do it for Christmas. It sounds mm -hmm. like since we just did it for Thanksgiving. It's very nice, mm -hmm. but quite frankly, there's been a constant flow of staff. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. then okay. So National yeah. yeah. Library Week. Should we shoot for that? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll bring it up again. I don't have more time. Perfect. All right. Go. Very good. Those are all. Oh, anybody else have anything for other, 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 Mary's other? Very good. Happy holidays. Great. Right. All right. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Diane, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, second. Aye. 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 And Diane, please take the roll. Aye. Aye. Thank you. 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 Thank